seekers of the path of knowledge especially those who are doing the path of knowledge program this is a part of that program and today we are going to have a test of riddhi okay you will get 10 questions and if you score more than 50 percent or 50 percent you will be sent to the step number four of the program and meanwhile everybody should pay attention then after the test we'll discuss all the questions and answers so these are your 10 questions okay try to answer as many as possible okay. so starting with the question one where is knowledge stored okay so knowledge is interrelated among experiences which are stored in the memory um but memory is also an illusion uh so and, and knowledge is false but um as per plk it's stored in memory uh in the end we also have to realize that knowledge is false and there is nothing to know question number two what preparations are necessary before joining the path of knowledge okay so the seeker should have some qualities uh which are necessary on the path of knowledge which are attention uh sharp intellect minimalism and open-mindedness and skepticism so these are some of the qualities which are required otherwise uh, it is difficult to progress on the path of knowledge but there are no practices needed the path of knowledge like there are no food habits or any clothing that needs to be changed question number three experience or logic which one is more important for gaining knowledge okay i think both are equally important uh, these are the two main means of gaining knowledge. Uh, without one, other cannot be uh, complete for gaining the knowledge. Knowledge is... Uh, so, once we get the raw experience, logic is applied on that and hence uh, the structure is formed in the memory. Question number four. That which is seen is false. This means the unseen things are true. <laughs> okay, true or false. That which is seen as false is a correct statement because what can be perceived as illusion only. This means that unseen things, there are no unseen things actually, there are no things. Um, the experience is true and it can be perceived. As a path of knowledge, truth is that which is unchanging. So, experience is true, but it is not a thing. Uh, so, there are no unseen things. So, I would say that first part is correct that which is seen is false and the only thing which is true is experiencer question number five why did the existence divide into two the existence did not never divide got divided into two it is just the mind which uh, uh, tries to understand the existence by studying it into uh, in two aspects which is experiencer and experience, but existence is not divided into two actually. It is just the mind which is creating the division. Question number six, the experiencer is everywhere. Then why do we only see experiences everywhere, not the experiencer? Experiencer is non-local. It can be experienced. It is true that we only experience the experiences everywhere. Why do we not experience that you are saying it is everywhere so if experiencer was experienced then it would not be experienced it will be it will become experience so it is not possible to experience the experiencer it is non-local it is the one which is experiencing everything it it experiences the locations also the locations are an illusion it is an experience only location is just a concept there are no locations actually so experiencer is everywhere a false statement it is known look question number seven events have a beginning and end but experience has no beginning and end that is true experience has no beginning and end because let's say if experience was beginning then there should be someone to experience the beginning and end of experience then that means experience was already there when the experience was beginning so this statement is correct that experience has no beginning and end question number eight vibration is the cause of experiences explain okay so vibration is a concept that we have come up to explain experiences uh, so vibration is a binary change and uh, by logic we observe that 
all the experiences all the complex changes are actually just a superposition of all the binary changes like all complex changes can be divided into simple sine waves so vibration is a concept nobody has seen vibration actually it is a concept and uh, by using it we can say that vibration is the cause of experiences we have come up with the concept to explain the experiences question number 9 what are the processes that make the memory semi stable um the uh, the process of induction is the main reason behind the experiences uh, appearing to be semi stable you are saying memory semi stable so the structure in the memory uh, appears to be semi stable memory is not directly experienced actually what we uh, what we uh, experience are irreducible which are also structures in the memory and the objects and all which are experienced appear to be semi stable because of a uh, process of induction uh, it is a special kind of pattern in the memory which has the uh, capability of copying uh, other acts so that is why it is felt that the semi stable question number 10 which states are necessary for faster evolution of the layered structure Um, the states like aware, equanimous uh, states uh, of the waking state uh, are states, and they help in evolution of the structure. And during uh, the dream state, um, induced uh, sorry, what is that? Lucid dreaming and spontaneous projections are the higher states. And during sleep, uh, yogic sleep. is the state which is helpful in the faster evolution because in the yogic sleep it is realized that i is just idea there is no i during yogic sleep yeah that are my answers guru ji okay very good thank you you got 7 uh, out of 10 which is a very good score very nice answers that means you are in the step number 4 and you can start the experiments especially of the awareness in the waking state dream state and the projected states because you are in the old program version 1 yes so there the practices yes. are little bit different but pay more attention to the waking state and for 3 months we'll watch you and you will need to send weekly reports just one line two lines and very good performance you also did very well in the writing so it was uh, almost ensured that you will pass the exam so congratulations thank you guruji i want to immensely thank you because after joining this program all my questions got answered actually i i was on different paths i tried many things from childhood i had several questions about existence of self and everything but no one could clear them and after joining this program there is no doubt that is remaining in the mind and i'm very thankful for that you got the basic knowledge essential knowledge that is perfect in you there are there were some errors which we are going to discuss now but, uh, i detected some points for accuracy that's all but uh, your basic is very good you will progress very well very big potential there thank you for so we are going to discuss the questions a little bit and after that if anybody has got any questions or any, any doubts we can take them up and i'll ask ask some questions in the satsang also just for uh, um, this little exercise so that everybody gets a chance to test their own knowledge so where is the knowledge stored very good answer it is in the memory and then she added that it is not true also <laughs> knowledge is also not true yes because it is simply a product of the memory process in the memory then number 2 was what preparations are necessary before joining the path of knowledge and she got half marks here 0.5 because she told that uh, these and that qualities are necessary some qualities are required but nothing extreme is necessary so um, we could have added here that uh, mostly on the path of knowledge no preparation is necessary here the Preparation has a uh, spiritual meaning, like purification or preparation of the body. Like preparation of the body is necessary in uh, yogic practices, tantric practices, and so on. And there are something, some more, like uh, you can say, 
selling pc is necessary in some parts but on the path of knowledge nothing like this so what is necessary open mind and drop your beliefs and become uh, curious there must be a desire to know and all this these can be called preparations surrender have some uh, discipline and follow the guru follow the instructions these things are necessary so anyhow her answer was good enough number 3 experience or logic which one is more more important for gaining knowledge and she said correctly that both are important so she got 0.5 but we must also say whenever this question is asked we should say that experience and logic both are important and then no logic is based on the experience only moreover the logic is needed in proper evaluation of the experience simply logic is not not so useful on the path of knowledge like uh, the logic that is used in mathematics or the abstract logic or any other logic is not that important so many people have this impression that logic is simply um, activity of the intellect it is simply some abstract thinking but we don't do that kind of abstract thinking on the path of knowledge especially to gain the essential knowledge we can do that in the scientific uh, part of the path of knowledge but uh, when the basic knowledge is there the logic is used in a special way it is called sound logic which is based on experience only so ultimately you can say it as right seen like in the old uh, scriptures you will often see this word how to see rightly how to see clearly right seeing the correct seeing in the occult field that is called clairvoyance so then it became a word for uh, observing the non physical but no the starting was like this how to see clearly that is the logical part simply do not assume that your current experience is right no it must be checked using your intellect that kind of logic we use so i know this was a little bit difficult question but ultimately the bottom line is both are important and she got half marks in one line we can say experience uh, combined with the right logic yields knowledge this was told in the program number 4 was that which is seen is false this means the unseen things are true is this statement true or false now she got 0.5 again here because she rightly said that whatever is seen is false but uh, her conclusion was not clear you must always say conclusion in the end of these kind of questions where the whole thing is true or false so <laughs> a little bit of tricky question here uh, ultimately it was not clear to me whether this whole sentence was true or false so that's why she got uh, 0.5 so i would like to ask this question in the satsang mm-hmm. if anybody wants to attempt this what is the conclusion of this question the first part is very clear that which is seen is false yes but what about the next part because it is saying that the unseen things are true it means the unseen things are true the first part is true probably the second part is not true so the whole sentence becomes false yes whole statement is false probably you said it but i could not catch it it must be made very very clear that this is a tricky question it is mixing something false into something true like the first part is the proper proposition but the second part after the comma is trying to conclude something which is not correct it is trying to infer from the first part that unseen things will be true but no the conclusion is wrong here so the whole sentence will be called a false st- statement yes so anybody else wants to say <laughs> why unseen things are not true because riddhi said that experiencer is the truth but in this sentence we are not talking about experiencer we are talking about things like she said experiencer is not a thing but no the sentence is not talking about experiencer here yogi is saying unseen and seen are same there is only one truth that is experienced probably you mean there is only one truth which is the experiencer are you sure you mean that the experience is the truth seen and unseen things are same that is also slightly controversial yes experience is the truth yes but we are not talking about that here we are talking about things like whatever your eyes are telling that is false but whatever your eyes are not telling you the other objects this sentence is saying they must be true then 
but no yeah, that that kind of logic is not correct yes things are false seen or unseen that is right siddharth is saying unseen things are uh, only things that aren't in your experience when we see them that is an experience which is false and this statement is false yes correct abhi is saying there is nothing unseen except the seer so yes unseen is true <laughs> yes and that is the controversial part here because the question is clearly saying unseen things experience it is not the thing not a thing so yes it is the truth but uh, we are talking about the unseen things what is an unseen thing think about it vipin is saying unseen things are possibility but everything is false yes you are approaching there and rahul is saying seen and unseen things both are or will be experiences so it is false yes yogi is saying unseen cannot be proved as true or false and let's see very good answer now very good answer yes see the unseen can be something imaginary also that is why we always say direct experience is the proof evidence what is the direct experience that we, which our senses are capturing which involves the senses so the unseen is probably something in the memory or something uh, imaginary and there is a possibility like he said said there is a possibility that there is a window behind me there is a door behind me there are trees and things in the garden behind me these are unseen but they are doubly false that means it is double false because it is simply projection of the memory now so <laughs> the sentence is saying that the unseen are true because you said seen are false so unseen must be true. it's like it's like a common man childish logic sentence is trying to this question is trying to do like this but when you uh, do a proper analysis you will find that the seen things that are told by the senses are false yes they are changing they are simply illusion created by the senses but the unseen things they are doubly false anyway this is my answer there can be more answer there can be better answer sanjay is saying there are no things in existence and hence later part is also false see obviously there is nothing in the existence it is empty only possibilities but a thing is clearly defined we call objects as things vastu we cannot say that they are not really there ultimately it comes out that their essence is emptiness but they are seen as illusions things are seen as illusions but something which is not even seen uh, nothing can be said like he said they are completely imaginary so is there a house behind me still there or not we don't know it can disappear any time isn't it <laughs> what about an emotion that is currently not happening is it actually there no it may or may not be there it may or may not come so like this when you analyze there is a double illusion here krishna is saying i'm seen not also illusion yes it's not even appearing so what can we say about it complete imaginary probably it is appearing as an imagination but then it becomes very complicated so this question was very tricky very difficult so think about it everybody should meditate on this number 5 why did the existence divide into two full marks uh, it did not divide like she said this is our again simply imagination or you can say it is the activity of the mind that does the division number 6 the experience is everywhere then why do we only see experiences everywhere not the experiencer and actually this answer was wrong so she got zero although the attempt was very good like she said experiencer cannot be seen it is not cannot be experienced but again the question is has a trick so anybody wants to attempt this anything any answer that is more accurate although it is possible to answer it like this that uh, no no the experiencer cannot be seen but then how can we say it is everywhere because everywhere we only see experiences there is no place of it like she said it is non local vandita is saying there is nothing to be experienced in the experience it is devoid of any quality which is not made up of anything that can be experienced because that is true it cannot be experienced abhi is saying by seeing the experiences experience it is itself illuminated you are almost 50% right 50% because there is a little bit of uh, inaccuracy in the words that you use but almost there abhi is almost there 
Siddharth is saying both do not exist independently of each other. And that is correct, you see. It is correct that the experiencer cannot be seen, will not be seen. It has nothing there to see. It is not an experience. And they exist together. They, are, they do not exist independently. That is right. But what the question is saying, it is a doubt. The question is doubt. It is doubting that you are calling the experiencer as omnipresent. But the actual thing that is omnipresent is the experience. Where is the experiencer? It is like it is an objection. And Kaurashiv is saying, what is the difference between observation and awareness? Well, that is a question now, but I'll give you one line answer. Observation is that which is coming through the senses. You can say perception or whatever we call as direct experience. And awareness is the knowledge that I am the experiencer. So if you cannot understand this, then you can ask it again after we finish the question and answers of the exam. Vipin is saying, experiencer has no qualities but and no form, but experiencer form of vibration that are perceived, like waves on water. Yes, it has no qualities, it won't be perceived. Then what is the point in calling it the, that it is everywhere? It is a very common sentence in, in the path of knowledge that I am everywhere, I am omnipresent. When Dita is saying experiences are changing aspect of the existence, only experiencer remains. Yes, you are also approaching the answer. And Rahul is saying, assumption that we see only experience is wrong in the question. There is only experiencing. <laughs> yes, you have now gone to the non-dual level. At the level of non-duality, there is only experiencing. And the experiencer is merged in the experience. So probably, yes, the answer lies in non-duality. Probably. So I'll attempt my own answer now. But all of your answers were very good. Uh, my thinking is that when are when you are looking at an experience there is the experiencer there also because without it there is no experience so at the level of non-duality we are actually looking at the experiencer only because it is the existence that you are looking at like we say at the level of non-duality existence is witnessing itself so probably the answer to this question lies in non-dual explanation that look like somebody said the experiences do not exist independently yes there has to be experiencer what is happening is we are witnessing it only in the form of illusory forms we are not witnessing something which is called an experience and then we try to find you said experiences everywhere experiencer is everywhere now show me and there we cannot give this kind of logic that it cannot be seen i cannot show you <laughs> or there are no places Look, the, here this explanation will not work because the demand is, the objection is something else. That why did you call it that it is present everywhere? If it cannot be seen, the correct word should be it is not present everywhere. So there are different ways to explain it. That uh, experiencer is the background of our every experience. It is present, but it is present as a background. That is also not very accurate. So ultimately we should go in the non-dual level here. Sanjay is saying, experiencer is encompassing the entire existence, is the seer of all experiences, hence can't be seen itself. Yes, you can say it is the existence itself. And you are looking at it whenever you look somewhere. You, what are you looking at? The existence only. And the existence is seen as taking on many, many forms, which are illusory. So we are seeing the one. The one is seeing itself. Yogi is saying experience is omnipresent. We are living being which itself is experience. Yes, ultimately the word we is meaningless in this uh, question. The word we is assuming that the humans are looking at the experience. No, no. The one that is looking is the experiencer. Wherever it is looking, it must be present here. So the sentence that uh, experiencer is everywhere is said in response response to this question, where is the experiencer? When you ask the where question, then the proper answer is it is everywhere. Or sometimes we say non-local. So as soon as we say non-local, probably people will not understand because they, all they see is locations. They do not see something which is non-local. So ultimately, the where does not apply on the experiencer. That is the right answer probably. And again, the experiences are not happening in places. So we cannot say the experiences are everywhere. The where and when they are experiences. The places and times are exp experiences. 
So both are non-local. So the question itself is totally meaningless now. When the thing there is no experience at any given instance, this proves the presence of the experiencer. Yes, so experience is always present. And it does not matter if you are experiencing a particular place or particular time, whatever we are experiencing or whatever is being experienced is myself. There is nothing else. So it is omnipresent. So I think this question is simply a very simply confusion of words only. <laughs> anyway, she did not get it right because very confusing question. Number seven, events have a beginning and an end, but the experience has no beginning and end. True or false? So I, I'll answer this and uh, probably her conclusion was true. She said it is true and uh, she got half marks here, 0.5. Because the experiences has no beginning and no end, that is true, isn't it? But uh, the first part is not true. Events have a beginning and an end. This part is also false. Actually, this part is false. The second part is true. Why do events do not have a beginning and an end? This is explained clearly in the program. Like we draw the graph timeline of events and then we try to find the beginning of the event and the end of the event and we see that it is arbitrary. The beginning and the uh, end of the event is also decided in an arbitrary way, which means you can decide wherever you want the beginning to be. So let us say there is this event of today's exam. So any person will say, okay, it has a beginning. It started at this time and it will end at this time. But uh, probably in the exam started as soon as I wrote down the questions. Probably it started as soon as uh, she contacted me that we can have a test. So where is the real beginning of the event of the exam? That cannot be decided. There is no real beginning. You can take any point in the time and you can say, yes, that is the beginning. So yes, it is subjective. <laughs> there is no beginning and end of the events also. So again, a tricky question. Two things are mixed here. This is trying to check your knowledge. How do you conclude? So next question. Vibration is the cause, cause of all experiences. Explain. And yes, she got full marks. It is not the cause. It is simply a theory, you can say, explanation of the experiences. Experiences do not have a cause. Number nine, what are the processes that make the memory semi-stable? And uh, I gave her full marks but it could be explained in a better way but, but this is the science part so we do not uh, emphasize accuracy that much you should have an idea how how the memory is made semi-stable and she said copying and induction and a few processes are there resonance and so that is okay fine good answer number 10 which states are necessary for fast revolution of the layered structure and full marks again she told a few states but there are probably more she said uh, the yogic sleep but awareness in uh, many states is needed for fast revolution so meditative states and concentrated state and all those states that we have explained in the program so yes i know it is very difficult to remember all those names what you should know is the basic that some states are necessary for fast revolution that much should be known then you can look up the names it's not very difficult very good attempt, Bharati, and you will progress surely. All the best. So now we'll go back to Q and A questions of others, if any. And there is one question by Korshed: The experiencer, observer, can feel without feeling. How can we say that the state is blissful or peaceful? Yes, feelings are an experience, and all the experiences are being taken by the experiencer. But and the state of bliss or peace is not an experience. Your first uh, uh, part is right. Yes, it can feel. You can roughly say like this without bringing the technical words <laughs> that feeling is an experience and it happens in the mind and then the experiencer is witness of it. It's okay to say that the experiencer can feel. But uh, on the part of knowledge, the bliss and the peace are not feelings. Then what are they? They are your nature. They are your true nature. Like uh, the water has waves on it, but the waves are not the true nature of the water. You can say the true nature of the water is the wetness or H2O, that which the water is made up of. So in the same way, the true nature of the experiencer is bliss. And bliss is simply peace. 
there is not much difference between peace and bliss you can say the bliss is simply a, a humanized version of peace and what is the meaning of peace there are no changes in the experience nothing changes there it is immutable changeless and because it is changeless it is the truth why there is nothing to change because it is empty there is nothing to change there because it's not any experience it's not any object which can change it has no qualities also the qualities are found in other objects the illusions so the peace and the bliss is not a quality is not a state that comes and goes it is simply that which you are you are the bliss you don't have the bliss sometimes and not other times they are not feelings so peace is simply absence of all activity that is what you are and because it is not negative any in any sense it is enjoyable we call it bliss we say the experience is enjoying the peace of simply being what it is and the word for it is bliss so yes many people confuse the bliss and peace as qualities of the experiencer no it has no qualities they are not states also when nothing remains there remains peace that is what the experiencer is but nothing remains no experience remains we we remove all the qualifications from the existence the essence that remains is the peace and it has many names like emptiness nothingness blissfulness or the perfection the wholeness like this so hopefully the answer is clear how can nothing consider to be peace this is a matter of terminology what would you like to call the absence of activities a name should be given to that what is the state of the experiencer when this question comes what is happening in me in very very simple english we can say what is going on in me and the answer is nothing and the one word that is chosen for this is peace so the word peace does not mean that which is written in your dictionary it is not an english word that which is written in dictionary means probably no noise a world peace there is no violence you know like this so we do not use that word that meaning here the peace is a translation of shanti in sanskrit because we do not mix the language here i have taken the word peace that is the accepted word in all the non dual uh, you can say traditions also we do not uh, call the absence of activities as uh, let us say inactivity not like this some people will call it silence that is another word and what is going on in the experiencer what is my nature and sometimes the answer is given silence which is equal to peace when you are silent mostly that means you are not speaking but that is not the meaning of silence it is a spiritual word the bliss is a spiritual word and the peace is a spiritual word and the emptiness is a spiritual word and uh, any seeker on this path should know the meanings of these words probably you don't know the meanings because you are not on this path properly are you in the program or have you taken the systematic uh, teachings from any guru before no yes it, uh, it will become confusing if you do not start from the beginning krishan is saying stillness and emptiness or nothing yes you see whatever word you give it to the experiencer they have mostly the same meaning when you say unchanging i am unchanging that also means stillness and the stillness also means silence and the silence also means peace and it also means be bliss so ultimately these words they describe what i am or sometimes they describe what i am not that i am not an activity i am not a state that goes and comes like happiness or sadness or uh, noisy mind or peaceful mind i am not all that so these are simply the words that describe me they are not qualities so my suggestion is not to look for the meanings of random words start systematically and the path of knowledge program is very good today only we launched new program which is very short and sweet so try that if you find that uh, interesting then you can join the full program it is a big commitment so we we wanted to give uh, people a taste of what the full program is like and uh, that is why this mini program was started where there are no writing no essays are written and no test and no practices 
and uh, we'll conclude today's session here and i'll see you next time thank you everybody for participating in today's session namaste